Um, my name is Jonathan Greenblatt. I'm the director of the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation, and really pleased to welcome you here this morning uh, to the White House Conference Center for this convening on Pay for Success. Um, it's, we have an exciting day planned, and I want to thank Jatinder Kohli for his terrific uh, opening remarks and laying the groundwork for what should be a very productive day today. We have a lot of people in the room who have traveled very far, and we're grateful for your time. And uh, let's get started. So without further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker today, really uh, our host here at the White House, Assistant to the President and Director of the Domestic Policy Council, Ms. Melanie Barnes. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you, and as Jonathan said, I know so many of you have traveled from all over the country to be here. It's a really, really impressive list. You know, we have a 7.30 meeting every morning um, uh, during the week and with the senior staff, and I was telling them about this convening today and where people were coming from, and people are just so excited about this idea. And I also know that we have a number of people who are watching um, as we're streaming this, and I want to welcome them to this conference and to this conversation as well. So thank you for I'm going to move this. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. You know, we have a really wonderful and eclectic gathering of people here today. We have those who are in academia, um, government leaders from federal and state and local governments, also philanthropists and service providers, as well as evaluators and financial intermediaries. We have uh, congressional staff here bipartisan, which um, is so wonderful because we know that this idea um, is one that is of interest to people on all sides of the aisle, and so, and bicameral as well, House and Senate. So I want to thank you all, and we think that mix of individuals, all of your ideas, your expertise will really add to the conversation that we'll be having throughout the day. And it is fitting that it's so diverse because uh, at the same time, we've got a common interest, and that is in identifying innovative solutions to solving our most challenging long-term social problems. Um, I know all of you know from the work that you're already doing that solutions to these problems do not come easily. And we certainly won't get to solutions by throwing money at the problem. We also won't get there by doing business as usual. Um, I remember during the campaign traveling um, around the state of Missouri, and the person I was traveling with used to say, if you're going to keep on doing what you've done, you're going to get what you've got. Um, and that means that for those things that are not working, uh, we need to come up with innovative ways um, to address them and new ways to solve these problems. We have to make sure that every single child has access to a 21st century education. That is an issue that is so important to the president, and I'm sure you've heard him talking about out educating the rest of the world over and over and over again. We also have to make sure that citizens have access to stable housing, to mental health services, and to nutrition, and ultimately, the, our big goal to economic opportunity. And we have to work together and learn from one another as we try to reach those goals. And also what we learn in Boston, we want to share with people in Topeka and those in Minneapolis and those in Petersburg, Virginia. There's no reason why a good idea has to stay in its hometown. Those, that's the good news. That's the innovation that we want to scale and that we want to share with everyone. So if we're truly to transform lives and achieve results for those who so desperately need it, we have to be committed to paying for and scaling what works. Pay for Success is a model that we believe offers a way to finance and to scale those innovative efforts and to find those achievable outcomes. It leverages cross-sector collaboration by bringing together the government and the private sector and service providers to provide what's so desperately needed effective solutions. And that's the idea when I was talking about it, as I said in the morning meeting that today, so many people came up to me afterward and said, this is such an interesting and uh, exciting opportunity, and how can we share this and bring this to scale? And I said, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about later. In this model, financing intermediaries put forward the initial money raised from philanthropy or private investors for an evidence-based program, that's an evidence-based program, to achieve an outcome agreed upon with the government, such as reducing our high school dropout level, levels that we know are unsustainable and also unconscionable, and increasing the number of graduates. If the goal is met, the government will provide a return on that investment, but only if that agreed upon benchmark is achieved. And this is not new money, pay for success leverages existing budgets. 
different streams of capital are available to finance social interventions. Pay for Success offers a way to move beyond privately funded pilot projects to publicly financed scaled interventions. By leveraging private sector financing and allowing more flexibility in the way that services are provided. We also know that it's important to work both within and without uh, and outside of government to work together to achieve these collective impacts. Working to collectively, we can achieve larger and more sustainable impact. For communities in search of solutions, and we know that there are so many who are out there trying to grapple with the fact that their students have fallen behind and are desperately trying to catch up, to help people with long histories of homelessness, with chronic homelessness, find stable housing, to help ex-offenders stay out of jail and become productive members of society, or to connect disconnected youth to employment and education opportunities, Pay for Success provides potential new way of doing business. We view Pay for Success as an opportunity to not only focus on how we're leveraging other capital, but to ensure accountability so that the limited dollars we're spending on social interventions result in a measurable positive impact. Pay for Success offers another way to shift the approach to federal investments from inputs to outcomes. And that's what we want at the end of the day. At a time of budgetary uncertainty, and I know that so many of you are grappling with that at home, just as we're grappling with that here in Washington, Pay for Success offers a new tool for the federal government to finance and scale social impact with a clear focus on demonstrated results. When governments at all levels are facing cutbacks, Pay for Success offers a new approach to investing in critical services for vulnerable populations that need more and not less support. In particular, Pay for Success offers a financing solution for preventative services, which as we all know, when times get tough, when budgets get tight, these are often the very first services that go, and at the same time, they're the services that over the long term are most likely to show results and actually change communities and change lives. For example, research shows that in the years leading up to kindergarten, that those years are often the most formative, the most determinative in shaping a child's foundation for learning and school success. We've seen it over and over and over, the economic models, the, the economic research, outcomes from health care to uh, crime prevention, the list goes on and on and on. Nevertheless, when budgets get tight, over and over and over again, we see early learning pro programs on the chopping block. And those vulnerable populations are the ones who, who suffer. Under pay for success, preventative services become the last services to get cut because of this collaborative model that we're talking about. So our goal today is to listen and to understand what the unique role is for the federal government to play so that we can do business differently. That's something that the president has been talking about from day one. And we've been able to weave that into the DNA, into the fabric of our initiatives for the last three years. And this is a new way to, to do that. And we want to learn a great deal from you. Many of you are here today, and many of you, as I said, are watching from uh, various states and cities across the country, and you're already thinking about pay for success outcomes. We want to know how you're doing this back home, and we want to learn how you're doing it. We want to learn about the innovative ways that you're driving performance like pay for success. We also want to learn from your best practices, and we want to leverage your actions to, and help facilitate more of those efforts across communities across the country. The administration is committed to launching a few pilots in 2012, and we are in active discussions with several agencies. At the Department of Education, an agency that has, I think, innovation in its DNA, we have high hopes for a pay for success model under our I-3 or Investing in Innovation Fund and in vocational education as well. Similarly, the Department of Labor is exploring the possibilities for pay for success financing within the Workforce Innovation Fund and other competitive grant programs. Other agencies are also assessing the potential for launching pilots using existing authorities. We hope that today's discussion will help us better understand the types of interventions that are ready for testing as pay for success pilots and how the federal government could potentially structure its activities and competitions to effectively test whether this new financing tool can drive performance, improve results for at-risk populations, and 
lower government costs all at the same time. The bottom line is this for us. We want to pay for success and get results that benefit the country and not spend tax day taxpayer dollars on efforts that are not working. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for bringing here, being here. Thank you for bringing all of your experience and your expertise um, and being willing to share that with, with us um, here at the White House, as well as colleagues from around the country. As I said, we are eager to listen and to learn from you. And I'm looking forward to say, staying and being able to hear the first panel as they come forward and start to talk about pay for success. So thank you so much for your vision, for traveling all this way, and we're looking forward to having a really wonderful day with you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melody. I'd like to invite the next panel to come up. We're having a panel on pay for success in theory and practice moderated by Doug Besharov, and he will be moderating a discussion among Linda Gibbs. Jay Gonzalez, Robert Gordon, and Kippy Joseph. I'd also like to invite people to fill in the empty seats. We have about six or seven empty seats in the room. Uh, so unless you're working the meeting, we invite you to sit down. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, that was just great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being with us. Uh, I'm Doug Besheroff. I teach at the University of Maryland, and uh, I also uh, conduct a project on comparative public policy at the Atlanta Council. Uh, one of the things our project does is try to learn from abroad, and what you'll learn, what you've already learned this morning, and what you'll learn through the discussion is that part of the knowledge base for pay for success, part of what we're learning from, uh, comes from the UK. And so for my project, which says there are things to learn about in other nations, uh, this is a very uh, rewarding experience. Uh, so the job, the real job of a moderator is to introduce the speakers, uh, explain the rules of the game, and get out of the way. So I'm going to do that and get out of the way. We have four great panelists here, some of whom I uh, known in the past and some I've just met this morning. Our first speaker is going to be Robert Gordon. He is Executive Associate Director of OMB, the Office of Management and Budget here. Uh, prior to that, he has a long resume, but the most important thing is that he worked in the New York City Department of Education uh, and had the um, great honor of working with my daughter, who is a very junior <laughs> minion there. Uh, but he would not have accomplished nearly as much as he did if it weren't for uh, her efforts. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, well, anyway, um, he's going to be our, Robert's going to be our first speaker. Then Jay Gonzalez, who is the secretary of the Massachusetts Executive Office for Administration and Finance. Um, reading these bios as I was preparing, it's just so uh, impressive. You know, I go back and I supervise a couple of research assistants, and I have a little bit of a staff. So uh, Jay oversees 15 state agencies. Uh, he prepares or helps prepare the governor's budget recommendations, develop the state capital budget, monitors and manages budgetary activities for the state. And the most impressive thing that he accomplished, without my daughter's help, but she lives in Massachusetts, so, uh, <laughs> is that um, uh, under his uh, leadership, the bond rating for Massachusetts is AA+ which I think translates to a B in my school. But you know the way they rate bonds in this town, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Linda Gibbs is our third speaker. Uh, and uh, she is, her official title is Deputy New York City Mayor for Health and Human Services. I met Linda many years ago when we were both doing child welfare services. And so uh, she comes to this program uh, knowing the pieces that build up to the mayor's office. So it's very impressive. And I also should mention that she supervises, I have the number here, $20 billion of uh, activities. Uh, my daughter has no responsibility for those programs. So if they're not so good, it's not her fault. Uh, Kippy Joseph, uh, who is one of the driving forces behind this movement, is the director for innovation at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, now, when I read that, 
uh, first I said, there must be a typo. Uh, then I got tremendously envious. What a job. Uh, and what a challenging job. And that's what this conference is about, trying to generate energy behind innovation. Uh, that's not easy to do, but I think she's the right person to lead the effort. I mentioned before that I'm a great fan of learning from abroad. Um, Kippy did that, in fact, by spending time in the UK before she joined the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, uh, she worked at the United Kingdom's Young Foundation, which focuses broadly on social innovation by conducting research um, and program incubation. Um, delighted to have her here as well. As I said, my job is to get out of the way. Here are the rules. Uh, I'm supposed to ask one non-leading question that allows the uh, panelists to say whatever they want, but they can say it only in three to four minutes. Uh, then I start humphing and humphing, and then I ask a follow-up question, even if they're still talking. So if that's not enough warning to you, there you go. All right, uh, Robert Gordon, um, first you. Thank you very much, because this is your building here, so we're delighted to be here. Um, so we know that the Obama administration is interested in this idea of pay for success. Uh, perhaps you could tell us how the administration got to this interest and what are the steps that you're taking already. Uh, uh, thank you. Great question. Uh, great to see you all. I'll, I'll try. Um, it's terribly embarrassing when the moderator starts, uh, starts interrupting you, so I'm going to try to go fast. Um, um, uh, we have an enormous need to, uh, to figure out how to do more with less right now. The, the budget constraints, the debate in Washington, everything you all hear about every day, it, it constrains our ability to achieve our goals. And so that is the central imperative that we face as an, uh, when it comes to domestic policy, I think, and for us at OMB, it's, it's an imperative we, we address every day. Um, first few years of the administration, I think our, our central approach to, to doing more with less and uh, to doing more of what works and less of what doesn't was an approach that we called evidence-based initiatives. So we would, uh, instead of funding programs that were particular interventions, um, instead of telling grantees, do whatever you want, we would try to say, um, show us if it works. If it works, we'll give you money. If you got great evidence that it works, we'll give you even more money. If it's in an area we don't yet know if things work, uh, we'll evaluate and learn. Uh, and we've, we've, I think, successfully set up a pretty uh, impressive suite of programs across agencies. Department of Education, Department of Labor, HHS, that adopt this approach. Um, and I personally think it's a great advance over a lot of traditional grant making. So everything from the I3 program in education to the Nurse Home Visiting program in HHS to our new Workforce Innovation Fund at the Department of Labor all embed these principles. Uh, there are challenges for evidence-based programs. Um, one of the challenges, obviously, is uh, coming back to the limits on our resources, uh, can we fund truly what works based on evidence in the past? Um, George Overholzer, who's speaking later on, speaks very beautifully about this. The best evaluation is always an evaluation of something that happened in the past, and the world is always changing. Uh, and the evaluation is always of something in one particular place. And what you really ideally would be doing is not funding something based on evidence that it worked then, but funding it based on evidence that it is working right now. And, and that insight drives you to a different kind of funding model. Uh, the, the second thought that, that we had uh, is that our government selection processes, even in these evidence-based programs, which I think are an enormous step forward from prescribing, we need you to run a program with these 12, that does these 12 things and only these 12 things. And I think a step forward from a block grant that says do whatever you want. But, but there are limits to a government selection program. Uh, uh, I probably don't need to tell all of you about this, actually. Um, there are things that a foundation can do in selecting grantees that, that we can't do. A foundation can send a program officer out, they can make phone calls, they can see, hey, what do you know about these folks? That's how ordinarily we learn. It's very hard to do in the government for good reasons, for things, legitimately things that people are worried about. Um, and of course, the oversight that we do in the government is inherently limited. So moving to pay for success, uh, the possibilities we see are to fund not just based on what worked in the past, but based on what's working right now. Uh, to have metrics that uh, carefully, uh, deliberately um, identify 
actual progress, enormously difficult. You have challenges around cheating, which I learned something about in the New York City schools. You have challenges around, um, uh, uh, you have challenges around creaming, which particularly if you look at an area like workforce is an enormous issue. So getting the metrics right is very challenging. Uh, and then lastly, if, if, if we can get private entities to do some of that selection, so getting someone else to put their skin in the game, to put their dollars in the game, so that it's not just us saying, hey, based on this really thick application, we think this is the best program, but it's somebody else who's come in and said, you know what, we'll put up our money. We're that confident this is going to work. And if this doesn't work, we're the losers, not just you. We see that as a, having enormous potential. So really exciting. How are we going to try to do it? I'll just talk very briefly to follow up on what Melody said. Um, and, and these are investigations that are still preliminary. We laid out a bunch of areas we wanted to work in in our 2012 budget. We're working with the agencies that we talked about. Department of Education, a lot of excitement about doing something of this kind. I talked about the Invest in Innovation program. I think there are real possibilities there. There are real challenges, too. The law is not really set up in a way that's so friendly to this um, in, in every case. So we're working those through. We're hoping to get some language from Congress uh, that would be enormously helpful to make this work. Um, uh, but in the I3 program, we could fund everything from um, early intervention, which Melody talked about, uh, to special education, to after-school programs, the kinds of things that SES providers do. Um, real interest in vocational education. The Labor Department, this Workforce Innovation Program, um, we're, 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 um, we have a, an evidence framework there. The thing that we're looking at is can we embed additional elements that would be supportive of these approaches. Um, and the last that I'll mention that I know is a particular interest of Doug's is foster care. Um, uh, we have an entitlement program right now that provides money uh, based on number of, of days or time that children spend in foster care. Um, to some degree, it's the more, the more a state spends, the more money the federal government spends. Um, if we can say that actually the better the results that a state gets, uh, uh, the more money it will get. Um, that's a simple idea, enormously complicated in practice, but obviously there, there is real potential in that space, and it's something that we are, I, I, I'm far from being able to make promises, but it's something that we're looking hard at. Um, last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, um, this is an area that, that we will never get it done without the innovation and leadership of the people here. All we can do is, is create conditions maybe say, you know, we will, we will advantage these kinds of programs that are trying this, we'll do this kind of pilot. But ultimately, n not only the work and, and, and sort of specific service delivery has to come from states and localities, but I, I think the actual ideas and thinking through of a lot of the very hard design questions have to, just because it is enormously complicated and, and, uh, and uh, we got so much going on, it's just hard to, it's, it's, it's very hard for us to work it all through. So this is a great conference, and, and look forward to your leadership. Robert, thank you. Before you pass the baton and the microphone, uh, a follow-up question. You mentioned it briefly, and I may have this wrong, but I think the administration has a, has a proposal that's in the budget. Could you talk for a minute about that? Yeah, so what we proposed in the budget was to add language uh, to several different programs in different agencies that would make it easier to run a, a pay for success program. The particular challenge that we have is if you think about the way that you want the funding to flow from the government, you want the government to make a conditional commitment of funding now um, and the funding wouldn't actually be paid. Uh, there might be some money up front. I actually, I, I don't think it's our view that, that it's not pay for success unless the government puts nothing in at the front end and everything in at the back end. There's, this is obviously a spectrum. We're trying to evolve different strategies, and, and I think there's a lot that we want to think of as pay for success, even if it doesn't exactly adhere to the model. Um, but if the, if the idea is, is at least significant amounts of money are on the back end, and the back end may not arrive for many years, um, that's not how discretionary government programs work. Typically, mandatory programs work can work that way, so that there's a there's a commitment now and there's money in the future. But typically, we have to obligate money um, in in the in the particular fiscal year. There's I think five years then for it to be spent. There can be conditions on it being spent, but that's all hard to hard to do under regular appropriations law. So what we're trying to do is to to get a very modest modification that would allow the money to be there moving forward. I think that's the central thing. 
Um, there are ways we can proceed if we're not able to do that, but it is, it is harder, um, and, and that's, that's essentially what the proposal is. It's not, uh, I should underscore, uh, particularly for any, anyone who works on the Hill who may be here or watching, um, we didn't ask for new money for this program. <laughs> um, we asked for existing funding streams, funding where the money might go out now under a traditional approach to be able to say, hey, for a little bit of that money, could we have it go out in this non-traditional approach where we think we might actually be able to get much more, much better outcomes for limited federal money? Robert, thank you. Uh, let's turn to Jay Gonzalez. Jay, um, every time someone talks about um, pay for success, they mention Massachusetts. So I think you are among the pioneers of this effort in the U.S. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and where the state is going? Sure. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think it's important first to give you the context with which I look at this issue and the way we are in Massachusetts. So first, I'm a budget guy in Massachusetts. I work for Governor Patrick. I do what Robert's office does for, um, for the president. Um, so the big context point for, for us in looking at this is we have just lived through probably uh, the worst fiscal crisis our state has ever had to go through, which I know many of you other government officials in the room are very familiar with. And we absolutely have to change the way government does business. We don't have a choice. I remember in the beginning of the recession, I think it was Rahm Emanuel used to say, um, this presents an opportunity for change. We're way past opportunity. <laughs> it, uh, we are at the point where we must change the way we do business. And we've got to show and demonstrate in every way that we can that we are stretching every taxpayer dollar as far as possible. So we, we have a number of initiatives going on in Massachusetts to change government programs, do things more efficiently, um, all, all also trying to at least preserve or where we can do better in terms of um, outcomes. And I think one of the things we're doing is trying to change the culture of managing and budgeting in Massachusetts and going much more towards what Robert described as an evidence-based system. And it was funny listening to you talk about the direction we need to go in terms of um, actually developing what our goals in government are, um, actually developing strategies for how we're going to achieve those goals, actually collecting data to figure out whether we're achieving the outcomes we're trying to achieve, it's like revolutionary. When I go to, when I go to um, talk to people outside of government and say, hey, this is the thing we're working on. This is big, and it's going to take us some time to get there. People look at me and say, you don't do this already? I mean, it's, it's amazing. But um, people in government knows, know how it works. We've got all these programs that have been in place forever. Um, they got this much money last year. We have this much money for it this year. And, and uh, we go and do it. We, we can't keep doing things that way. So we are very focused on changing the way government does business. And I think the Obama administration deserves a lot of credit for being a catalyst in getting uh, state and local governments to think this way um, through a lot of the initiatives in the ARA legislation, which um, they didn't just give us money. They actually said, what are you going to do with it? And um, show us and report that you're actually doing what you said you were going to do um, has been good for states, um, and it has resulted in our embedding this across um, everything we're doing in state in state government. So that's the context, and, and um, we became very interested in um, uh, pay for success, uh, and, I, and I like that moniker for it. We, we've been calling it social innovation finance. Um, I know others call it social impact bonds. But we, we were very interested in this as a tool um, to help further that um, result we want in terms of the way in which we're governing and investing uh, government resources to get better outcomes. And the reason we like it is um, it incents innovation uh, and in order to get better outcomes and uh, hopefully save taxpayers money. Um, we pay for outcomes um, instead of paying for inputs. Um, it's an opportunity for us in the, in the short term to shift financial risk until we get those outcomes, until we get to that, get over that bridge, um, which is very appealing. Um, and the thing I like most about it is the construct of it provides that discipline that I was talking about before that government needs. It requires that we undertake a thorough analysis of what our problem is, what the problem is we're trying to solve. It requires that we develop 
um, a strategy and understand what the proposed solution is and have a good level of comfort that it actually might work. Um, and it requires that we measure that um, the success of that initiative and to the extent it's successful, we put taxpayer dollars toward it. So it's the construct and the discipline of it is something that's very appealing to me and is the reason we have been pursuing it um, in Massachusetts. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. So, oh, oh, you you asked a question which I didn't answer, but I took advantage of the opportunity. You gave us to talk about whatever I wanted. You know, so let me. You, they come to Washington, and they, you know, this is what they do here in this town. But some of us say, uh, that's all right. I'm Ian, not, answer the question. I'm not even an elected official. Um, <laughs> so what are we doing? Um, we, we, uh, we put out an we decided we wanted to explore this, but we needed a lot more information to figure out um, what the best approach for, for us was. There obviously wasn't anyone else in the United States who had done it that we could point to and look at and learn from. Um, there are a lot of people, including many in this room, who we talked to uh, about this. Um, but what we did was we put out an RFI and requested um, information from stakeholders, providers, um, financial intermediaries, people in, in, who have been thinking about this and who might want to participate in this type of a program. And we uh, actually received over 30 responses, many of which from different types of social service providers who had ideas of areas where they're doing innovative things, whether it's in homelessness or workforce development or education uh, or corrections, um, where they felt uh, social innovation finance or pay for success could be a tool that could that could help leverage something they're already doing that could benefit the state and get us better outcomes for lower costs. Um, so most of the responses were from those types of folks. Some were from uh, some of the uh, organizations who want to serve as intermediaries or otherwise be a part of these uh, transactions uh, the way that they are traditionally um, modeled and, and described. So we have been for the last couple of months reviewing those responses. Um, what, what we've been focusing on is a couple of things. One is making sure we've got a program uh, and a proposal to fund that we think is going to have a high likelihood of success. And we're spending a lot of time, um, we're, we're focusing on homelessness and um, juvenile justice, um, preventative approaches to try to keep people from becoming homeless, uh, which is a very cost, it's, Sheltering homeless people is um, extremely costly, and homeless people tend to um, uh, take a lot of use of emergency medical services, which end up showing up in other parts of our budget um, in, in a very costly way. And it's very costly to detain uh, juvenile delinquents, much more cost effective if we can figure out effective ways to help them in the community and to keep them from coming back into, um, into prison. So we've been focusing on those two areas, and we're working on trying to make sure we've got a good, clear definition of the population we're trying to serve and the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, we're also doing some diligence on the proposed solutions that um, we, we received for these areas through our RFI, um, doing things like looking at our Massachusetts homeless population and looking at our Medicaid data and, and matching um, that data up to really try to determine whether there's evidence um, through the information we already have that if we are able to get um, homeless people into uh, permanent housing, permanent less expensive housing, that we will also save money on healthcare related expenses. So we're investigating all of that. And we're also doing a lot of work thinking about appropriate models for structuring these transactions and the public-private partnerships that um, would be associated with them. We expect to be in a position in two or three weeks to put out um, two requests for proposals um, for uh, social uh, pay-for-success um, uh, contracts in the area of homeless uh, prevention and um, juvenile delinquency prevention. Jay, thanks. And I can't uh, help but mention before turning to Linda, uh, it's so striking how much care and planning is required to do this right. It, you just don't say, let's do it. And I have a feeling that in New York, there's a similar planning process going on. And Linda, why don't you describe what's happening in New York? Sure. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because listening um, to, to Jay and Robert, the um, 
the path in New York was uh, a little bit the opposite. At the beginning of um, the mayor's third term, I gathered up um, my commissioners and I, I said, let's um, sit down, plan for what the big initiatives are that we ought to be focusing on. Where are we going to um, push our agenda and where are the areas that need our attention? And it was about a year at that point into um, the onset of the, um, of the recession as after the, um, the, the market crash. And I was getting, um, I won't call it resistance, I might call it sort of um, reality, that um, folks are saying, hey, listen, you know, great, you know, we can dream up plenty of big ideas, but where are the resources going to come from to do this? And so we didn't, we, um, you know, we, we went along our path of doing our planning, um, but I was really struggling around that, that question of resources. And so... Um, um, it was during that process, in fact, that I was uh, introduced to the social finance folks in the UK um, via their report that they issued on on this social impact bond financing mechanism. I'm like, huh, that's really interesting. You know, maybe this is a way to to, um, to grab some new money that could come in and help to jumpstart some of our initiatives. So by the um, um, the beginning of the mayor's third term, we also had settled on one very important priority for us, which is uh, what we call our Young Men's Initiative. And the focus is to look across all social indicators, um, health, education, employment, justice, um, and look at the disparity in outcome for black and Latino boys in our city. And we've uh, developed a very aggressive agenda around that to really try to tra tackle it on all those fronts. And so what we wound up doing basically was, um, was sorting through the initiatives and, um, and putting them into, into categories. Um, and one category was which ones might be suitable for social impact bond financing. Simultaneously, we really rolled up our sleeves and started to think through the mechanisms and, um, and you know, what does the contract look like? How do you, how do I, now here was the programmatic folks with a great idea um, going to the budget office and saying, we've got a great idea. And, you know, sometimes the, the door kind of slams in your face, you know. You know? Not <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Everywhere else, I'm sure the door is always open to um, program people that want to spend money. Um, and so... Um, and so it was a little, so we had to start the conversation. It wasn't the budget office leading the battle. It was sort of the, um, us bringing them into the conversation and trying to, um, to really engage um, their creativity around the, this alternative financing mechanism. So, the, the, so you know, long story me medium, um, what we've wound up doing, it's really interesting. Um, we actually, when we started the process, we thought we had five or six projects that would be really great. Um, for this mechanism. Where we are at this point is um, we've chosen our, um, our most favorite, um, the focus, and, and I'd be glad to talk about the details of it, but just to, um, it is again in the, in the justice area. For us, it is um, focusing in the um, adolescent portion of our adult system. Um, so we do, um, 16, 17-year-olds uh, um, do, do go through the adult justice system in New York State. Um, we house them together with 18-year-olds um, in our adult system, um, mostly on Rikers Island. And so we are doing an intervention um, while they're on island um, that's focused on reducing the chances that they will reoffend and recidivate back into um, jail or later into prison um, when, um, um, after their discharge. And so the um, sort of, it's a, and it's very interesting, it's sort of the, you know, can all innovation be proven? And if you need something proven, is it really innovation? And so trying to sort of walk this balance between evidence base versus trying out new stuff, um, you know, high risk investment versus, you know, uh, you know, it's really bond financing where it's guaranteed whether it works or not. So lots of um, details associated with what do the contracts look like? What do the um, service contracts look like? What does an investor need in order to feel confident in the return on investment? Who determines whether it worked or not? Who's your evaluator? How much do you have to pay for an evaluation that gives you a level of confidence? And does that wind up eating up all the potential profits? So the really tricky issues. And so in a way, we also did that part upside down or in reverse of, um, of the, the state and federal effort that, um, that you just heard about. We sort of worked out the details around this one project with the thought that if we can get all those mechanisms in place and get the basic rules of the game and parties all set, then um, it'll be easier, sort of clear a path a little bit for some um, new ideas. 
Um, and so that's, um, that's sort of the sort of our story of how we came to this, how it's incredibly useful um, as an alternative that I, I think is particularly in these um, tough budget times that can allow sort of, you know, sort of creativity and new stuff and fresh thinking happen in government when you're otherwise under siege from all these budget constraints. Before turning to Kippy, let me ask both of you, um, how are you doing, where's the money going to come from? Have you talked to people who might be investors? Or is it going to be the state? And how was that? Yeah, there's um, there's a tremendous um, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of interest. I think that at this point um, um, we're looking at philanthropic um, dollars as the starting point, and um, uh, at the same time, I would say I've had a number of conversations with uh, individuals who are very creatively engaged in the co in in this talk. Um, that are thinking about other, um, you know, more, not philanthropic, but private sector investment. Um, there's a lot of, so. so um, Both. Both, thank you. Yeah. We, we have not decided yet, and I, uh, part of our RFP process for the specific proposals we're gonna be um, soliciting will hopefully help us flesh out what those options look like and, and what the best approach for us is. I mean, there are obvious benefits to having private financing in the sense that we don't need to come up with at least all of the money or any of the money uh, up front and we're able to shift financial risk. The other thing that's good about it is there's an enhanced level of oversight and discipline that's required because you've got to not only uh, make ourselves comfortable that this is going to work in the end, but we've got to make them comfortable and, and that's a good thing, I think. On the other hand, if there is a, an investor involved, then uh, necessarily we will not be reaping all of the benefits of what uh, all the financial benefits of um, the outcomes or the the lower costs achieved. So I think that's the balance, um, and so we we have not yet decided. And I think that's one of the things we want to um, explore in a little more detail. I, I think the striking thing, Kippy, is how much of this is being developed as we go. So um, Jay's already told us that you don't have to answer the question that's asked. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the question that's asked. Um, so at Rockefeller, I take it that you have two parts of this process. One is um, shepherding the idea of pay for success. And the other is either directly or indirectly facilitating the flow of funds, whether it's philanthropic or private sector. So if you could address both of those or any other question that you felt like addressing, yeah. that would be wonderful. Great. Thank you. Um, <coughs> for Rockefeller, the tie that binds both sides of that together is that the concept of the social impact bond is really an innovation. It's an innovation in finance for human service delivery. And um, the foundation's been long interested, has a long history of catalyzing or supporting innovation from um, establishing the means to cure hookworm in the South here in the U.S. to literally seeding, like creating the seeds for the Green Revolution in Asia. So um, innovation's a buzzword. We hear it every day. I, I, you know, If I put marks on my paper of how many times it was already said this morning, my paper would be overflowing. So why innovation? It's not just for the sake of innovating. It's actually because the capacity to innovate is critical when the problems that we're facing as a society change constantly. So poverty doesn't look the same as it did 50 years ago, 20 years ago, because of our dynamic economy. And I don't mean dynamic like robust, I mean dynamic like ever-changing. So um, it's really a, a, a necessary capacity, not just for service delivery uh, providers, but for government and for those of us who um, work to fund it or support it in other ways. Um, so the social impact bond um, also is it's really an innovation in that it combines unlikely bedfellows, and we know that the best innovations do, right? So when you're combining people and perspectives that don't usually get into the same room, that creates the energy and the juice and the new idea to make things different. And it offers now an opportunity to radically reorganize the way we drive towards outcomes and the way we fund them in human service delivery. So that's why Rockefeller's been interested. It's the, that tie that binds both impact investing um, and the, the grant making that we're doing. Um, for other philanthropies, I think they're interested because of the content, not necessarily the process around it. And um, 
we've been thinking about three things that seem to resonate with other philanthropies and also with impact investors is that this is number one, perhaps first and foremost, as was mentioned before, the opportunity to unlock new kinds of financing for prevention-oriented um, services. And we know that in times that budgets are cut, that prevention is the first thing that goes. So for foundations who care about particular issues um, and for um, impact investors who care about particular issues, this is a really critical way to protect those services. Um, also, you know, you, I think you said it, the rigor, Jay said, that we want to insert into the way government pays for what it gets on behalf of us taxpayers. So we are really looking at um, supporting government to pay only for success um, and not for failure, um, investing sort of more rigorous understanding of how you get to those outcomes. Um, and the last thing I say is that it would be a shame if foundations were the only target audience for the investment for these social impact bonds, especially if those foundations are just moving money from you know, traditional grant making to these new, um, more interesting, more innovative ways of funding programs. Um, if we can tap into, someone earlier this morning in the pre-session said, can we make a distinction between the money that foundations give away um, as grants and the money that they invest out of their endowments, either as PRIs or MRIs or um, straight investments. So if we could tap into that money that foundations um, hold, that would be one thing. But really that should serve as a bridge to bringing in more um, dare I say it, more commercially oriented investors. People who care about these issues, but also, as has been demonstrated in infrastructure, can get into public-private partnerships to um, make a real difference and also um, see it as a good place to invest their money. Um, that it's not just about being altruistic, that it makes good sense for them as well. Did that answer your question? <laughs> sure, but I'm gonna ask a follow-up. Okay. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask a follow-up of Kippy, and then I'm going to ask another follow-up for the panel. And then by then, I hope many of you will have questions to ask of the panel as well. If not, I'll fake it. So uh, we'll go from there. Am I going, are we going to 11.30 exactly? Okay, so now you know when we're going to. So we're all responsible for ending at 11.30. So Kippy, um, of course, the Rockefeller Foundation is going to fund every project of the people in this room. Of course, we are. <laughs> and even all those watching in video. Of course, land. we are, right. Uh, but for the few unfortunates who aren't here, how should they think about approaching philanthropic uh, organizations besides Rockefeller? So, whether it's a small family foundation or a large family foundation in Topeka or some other national foundation. Well, I think this is actually really a call to the, um, the philanthropists and investors who are in the room and who are watching. It's incumbent upon us to do a good job of coordinating ourselves and the funds that we are interested in um, putting to this, um, especially in the beginning, so that it doesn't become um, additional work and more money and upfront costs for um, the intermediary or the deal maker, um, to use Jatinder's term from the earlier session, to have to run around the country and knock on all the doors. I mean, that's part of what keeps um, nonprofit providers in um, an unhealthy cycle is that they're constantly fundraising instead of focusing on either service delivery or improvements or innovations in service delivery. So I do think it's incumbent upon us to try to organize that money. And in part, what that will allow us to do, um, just as all the investment that um, foundations are and should be making in the enabling environment for social impact bonds, what, what that coordination will enable us to do is um, look beyond the individual deals that are going to happen, the individual bonds that will be issued, you know, the first one in New York City, the first ones in Massachusetts, to start to look collectively at a, as a portfolio, um, how are these bonds doing? What is the success rate of the whole portfolio? So that we can, I hope, organize ourselves <coughs> to be focused on um, the success of the concept as a portfolio concept rather than an individual transaction. 
There's going to be failure. I think we should we should recognize that there is going to be failure, and we don't want that to inhibit the potential of um, new geographies to try it or to try it in different ways, or for existing, you know, for a geography that a state or a local that um, tries it and fails to have the opportunity to do it again. Well, I'm glad you brought up about failure, and I'm, in a moment I'm going to ask Robert about. He mentioned matrix. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, so I'm going to ask about you know how we measure success or for fa failure. But you said something I just heard the one word, organize. So um, is there likely a development where a group of foundations will get together, if not to fund in a collaborative way, at least to uh, coordinate thinking and research about pay for success? I wish I knew the answer to that question. I think that there's so many different perspectives on this from different kinds of funders that there is no answer. But um, Is there something people in this room can do to help that process? I think talk to each other. I think talk to the um, uh, this group, talk to itself. I think talk to the folks who are out ahead, the states and the locals who are out ahead. Um, you'll hear on the panel from some of the people who are in sort of um, pivotal positions in the network, um, whether it's an intermediary or the technical assistance lab that's being developed um, out of Harvard, I think that there are some key places that that conversation can happen. And of course, we're happy at Rockefeller to talk to folks as well. Well, Robert, matrix, success, failure. Um, when I'm up on the hill, there's a group of people who seem to think every program works, and they have data to prove it. <laughs> and then there's a group of people who think no program works, and they have data to prove that. So I, we haven't talked about this, but I, I'm guessing that you all have thought about this problem. And you mentioned developing matrices. Where are you on that, and what can you tell us about that? Did I really use the word matrix? You surely did. <laughs> Didn't he? Raise your hand. He. Thank you. He did. I was listening to every Gosh, word. Gosh, I, I, I just think of a matrix as a, as a weird movie. Wow. Um, um, so I, I, think, um, I think you're right that there are different ways to define success. Um, so let me, so we're not going to require randomized trials, are we, on every project? Uh, no. Okay. And I think, um, I, I guess let me just make two comments that I hope are responsive. One to your, your, most, your last point. Um, we've always said that when it comes to evaluating and measuring, um, the method of evaluation, uh, and the degree of rigor, and the cost should be matched against the level of development of the intervention. And so if you have a new and promising idea that's a $2 million program, you don't want to run a $5 million RCT on that program. Um, on the other hand, if you have a program that the feder that federal or state government has been investing tens of millions of dollars in for years and you don't really know what you're getting out of it, that might be an appropriate place to go for a more rigorous evaluation. Um, the second point I, I, I just want to make about the definition of success, um, it is ex extraordinary that the 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 high bar that I think Jay and Linda have set for themselves in defining what success means in this context, because the ability to, not only for an intervention to save the government money, but to know that it saves the government money, to be able to capture those savings, and then to be able to uh, allocate them in a, a financial instrument, um, enormously challenging and a wonderful thing to be able to do. I think of the work and the conversation we're having here as potentially being very valuable, even when you're short of being able to do that. So if you take something like early childhood education, which we know when it's well done, there are savings that, uh, there are benefits to kids that occur over decades. And they're not just benefits to, that are captured in, in, in the government's balance, they're benefits to society. Uh, we also know that these programs are enormously varied in their level of quality. When you do it right, there are great gains. When you don't do it right, there really aren't. And so if we can figure out a way to drive early childhood programs toward better outcomes, 
we invest huge amounts now. We will continue to do so. We should. We as administration think we should be investing even more in those areas. Uh, but we should be investing right. And if we can figure out a way to do it better, um, th that's a great thing, whether or not we can capture the savings from doing that. Um, and I think the kinds of approaches we are talking about here, uh, like paying based on outcomes, like bringing in separate investors. Obviously, the expectations of investors are going to vary depending on the kind of program you're setting up, and the financial mechanism will vary. But if we can do that, that's a great thing. Um, and I, I think we would, we would call that a success also. So the rule, this is a debate. You're not allowed to touch each other. Um, <laughs> but um, when you mention somebody else's name or state, uh, the, the state gets to reply. So I, I had kind of tapped Linda to ask if she wanted to reply, but I noticed that Jay grabbed the mic. So yeah. he wants to reply. Go for it, Jay, and then we'll turn to Linda. Thank you. I think it's a great rule. Um, <laughs> uh, I, agree. I agree with what um, Robert said, and I think we obviously need to be investing in prevention uh, in all the places that all the studies and experience um, tells us is going to pay off for us down the road and pay off for the, be for the beneficiaries of uh, the populations we're trying to, to serve. However, when I, when I look at this um, pay for success tool and the way we're thinking about it, particularly as a budget guy, um, Linda may think about it in a different way, but I want to be able to draw a line and show quantifiable results. Um, it's important um, not just because uh, I want a, a level of comfort that we're getting the results both in terms of outcomes and f uh, financial results that we expect um, from an innovative approach like this, but I think it's important also to sell it um, politically, to get buy-in for it. This is a very different thing. Um, this government doesn't do this type of innovation very much or very well. Um, and we need to prove success. So I, I th my own feeling, at least initially, as we embark on this, and this is a huge challenge, is to figure out which programs, you've heard they tend to be preventative programs because there's potential there for a, a bigger return on investment if we succeed at it. But which programs are the ones that lend themselves to being able to prove that quantifiable success? That's the way we're thinking about it. And it's challenging because in the homelessness uh, situation, for example, there are cost savings if we are helping to subsidize a permanent housing, which has a better outcome for the homeless family, say, than if they are in shelter. But there are also savings um, in our Medicaid budget, potentially, as I described. Um, that type of cross agency government um, evaluation and potential savings across budget line items, that kind of stuff doesn't happen in government right now. But it, it should. We should be thinking about these problems in a holistic way and not in the silos that are created by government department and government line item. Um, but that takes work to figure that out and to track that. Uh, there are also lots of, there's going to be particular interventions to try to get the results we're looking for. but. Those interventions likely aren't the only factor that results in, for example, someone becoming homeless or a juvenile going to um, getting in trouble and, and going to prison. Uh, and some of those other factors um, may be hard to control. So um, defining very clearly what the intervention is, what the expected results are, how we're going to measure those results so that we can prove that success is important, I think, um, to um, our being able to implement this in a successful way. Yeah, Linda, uh, before you answer, I'm struck by having listened to Robert and Jay's response. So I'm sure I got this wrong, but I'll. So in effect, Jay talked about an outcome that could be a decade or more in the future. When you talked about early childhood, Jay, uh, Robert, you were talking about a res some kind of effect that would come after schooling in general, uh, better job, better home life, whatever. And Robert was, uh, Jay, excuse me, was talking about outcome measures that could be um, taken one or two years later. So there's quite a striking difference. Now, I, it may not have been deliberate, but it does seem to me there's that. So before you answer, though, Robert, Linda's going to solve the problem, come up with the answer. So the um, 
for us, and I guess my take on it is that there, there isn't a right or a wrong answer, that there are a lot of different performance-based con contracting arrangements, and they're, they're along a continuum. And the, conti the point in the continuum that I'm working on in this project is the, probably the furthest in terms of not only demonstrating good social outcomes, but also demonstrating government savings. And having the proof of that government savings be the, um, the condition of the contractual term committing for the repayment of dollars to the investor. And so, um, and you know, that doesn't mean that all these other points on the, on the scale are, are not appropriate ways to go. It's just, this is the, the work that we're doing. The um, part of the decision about uh, appropriate projects was in fact um, the ability to prove that. Uh, as a city government, we needed to achieve enough city tax levy savings in order to repay the investor because savings in state and federal dollars were not accessible to us to control and contractually commit for repayment. So a bunch of projects dropped off the table for, um, because we just were at the local level. It also pushes you into those things that are heavily local where you don't have matching funds, and so you get a lot into the justice world, you get a lot into the homelessness world. Um, <clears throat> the other um, thing that um, then sort of factored in was this period of payoff. And the way that we are um, talking about structuring our repayment schedule is to use administrative data. We're going to try to take um, the closest cohort to move through the system without the intervention and, and use their experience and then compare it to the cohort of um, young men who receive the intervention. And as soon as we have comparative data um, adjusted by one, so it's the recidivism adjusted by one thing, which is court processing time. So because it's about saving day, um, bed days on Rikers and um, closing those beds to achieve the cost. And, and so we thought, you know, quick and dirty, we want to get payments out um, as fast as we can, just use the raw administrative data adjusted by that court time and then make a payment. But then do a post audit where we have, that's where our independent evaluation comes in, where um, the really smart people um, sit in, you know, in their, in their cubicles and do the um, smart evaluation and adjust for all different kinds of things. Has your population changed? Did, are, they now, are they now older? Are the crimes different? Um, have you changed other practices in, um, in your world? Are there more alternatives to incarceration? Is there better? So trying to adjust for some of those other things and really clean up the data and then just do a post audit reconciliation on the repayment. And so, um, and this really does get down to, um, I'm actually in the camp of, um, and maybe because I'm not the investor, but instead the spender of money, I want to keep it quick and simple. Um, from an investor perspective, particularly if we want to bring those private investors um, to the table and it's a real business negotiation, the investor's going to want to know um, if wh whether or not their savings got discounted because something else um, happened that caused increases in arrests or increases in length of stay, that kind of, that kind of thing. So, um, and the last thing I would say is that I have found it like um, uh, we're, we're very focused on doing evidence-based work, doing more solid evaluation of, um, of anti-poverty work in New York City than I think is, has been our track record and I think perhaps is the national track record. So we're really very focused on increasing um, the use of evaluation to inform programs and spending. That being said, um, I think you can get too crazy with this, and I think that um, at some point you have to say, you know, what, account for the big factors, but if you're going to start putting the burden on yourself of doing too much, then you're going to, um, you're going to lose too many programs. You're going to lose too many projects. Um, and, so, um, and so it's really great to have um, everybody looking at these things, and it, I, I think it sort of has upped the ante once again in terms of the rigor with which we look at the, our interventions, creates an accountability that has been a self-imposed accountability up to now. The investors add, you know, sort of the very business reality, you know, business terms of the deal accountability. Jay, go ahead, and then I'm going to go to Just Robert. quickly, <clears throat> on, the, on the point you raised, Doug, about um, the fact that I didn't mention early childhood interventions, I think we know they work. But we did, we did look at whether or not that scenario we should be pursuing uh, for a pay for success model and decided not to because of that period of time and, and the difficulty of drawing the line between the intervention and the successful outcome. Um, I think everybody knows that there are more successful outcomes from those types of investments. 
Um, but from a, the ability to quantify it on a person-to-person -person basis from an intervention like that takes a very long time and is uh, very challenging. So we, we, for purposes of using this model, we stayed away from it. So this panel has taught me a great deal. One thing it's taught me is to ignore questions. Um, it also taught me, I was just instructed to go to Q&A, so I can now interpret Q&A. I will ask the question, and someone will give an answer. Robert, uh, the rule is, if we mention you, you get to reply. So you don't have to, but this, this goes to the question. I use you as a straw man because you use the early childhood, so I asked about the long term. And it does seem to me we've identified something quite real here, which is that some programs, no matter how much we believe they will work, or even if they do work, if the measurement of the impact that we want is 10 or 15 years later, they may not be appropriate for the first round of pay for success. Do you want to say anything about that or just give up? I, I think we, um, so first of all, I, I, I guess I want to say, I think that there's a continuum here. Um, the, the kinds of um, where we can identify immediate gains and immediate savings and develop a, a pay for success approach as Linda and Jay have talked about, it is wonderful to be able to do that. As they've both said, it's a limited set of cases in which you can do that. And I think all of us are responsible for a huge range of programs. and attempting to improve all those programs. So one of the challenges is, or questions is, can we apply insights from this approach more broadly? That's one point. To, to answer more directly, I think we're maybe conflating two separate things. One is, uh, can we identify gains in the short term? And the other is, can we capture financial savings in the short term? I think when it comes to early learning programs, we know well, at least m my view and my sense of the research is we can know fairly quickly if they are effective. Um, and, and we have been, as an administration, extremely aggressive about trying to improve the quality of early learning programs. So in Head Start, we have a proposed rule that is, you know, I think widely viewed as the largest change in Head Start in 40 years, where we'll say the lowest performing quarter of programs which have been getting contracts on a regular basis have to recompete for the first time. Um, and we'll identify those low performers based on metrics which include performance measures, observation of teachers. And there's good evidence to suggest that those observational metrics correlate with outcomes for kids over time. So if, if a, a classroom is scored well uh, uh, right now, those kids are likely to be doing well in a few years. I, I think, so you, you can know, not perfectly, but reasonably well, reasonably quickly, whether that program is effective. It's a different question whether you can capture the savings from those gains, because the savings may not be achieved for 15 or 20 years. And I think then the question becomes, can we, what are the, what, what's in our toolbox to encourage better programming in the short run? I just described one approach in the toolbox, which is recompeting bad grantees. And I think that, that other approaches in the toolbox would be to say that funding for programs, instead of being all up front and are using recompetition or those kinds of regulatory tools, uh, but, but one of our approach, a, a, a different tool would be to say that some of your money or, or significant amounts of your money will be conditional on showing outcomes. So I guess I would just separate out the issues in that way. Good. Uh, I'm really being pressed for real Q&As. Uh, Q&As, but I'm going to ask the panelists when they answer the questions, uh, since the questions are not going to be nearly as good as the questions I asked, keep your answers shorter. Go ahead, please, and identify yourself if you want to. Larry Wilder um, from Virginia. Uh, I'm curious, particularly from uh, Jay and Linda, regarding the process by which you're looking at, which you approached vetting um, uh, applications. Uh, one, to the degree that you're a budget guy, how did you address when it was cost avoidance versus cost savings? I'm assuming you did address that if you were, you know, at whatever benchmark it was, 5, 10, 15 years out. And then also in the process by which you were vetting them, who's in the room? In other words, you've got planning and budget clearly, but other you know, programs or, or agencies, especially if you're doing a holistic, rigorous approach, who's in the room? Is it formal, you know, pursuant to a you know, particular time frame? I'm assuming you've gotten the, the imprimatur from, from the governor or the mayor, and at what point to really drive it, assuming it's being driven by, by the top? 
but uh, but but the process by which you all are organized around vetting the various w Linda, why don't you possibilities. Go first? Um, which will be easy because um, for us, we actually um, are going to hopefully steal a page out of the Massachusetts book. Um, um, for us, the process was the idea came first, and um, and so it wasn't as if we had to. We, we did look at, uh, we had our range of programs under the Young Men's Initiative that we wanted to um, pursue. And, and so it was sort of really thinking is, is it appropriate for this kind of financing? Um, we, and then we, as program leads, brought in um, the lawyers, the, um, the budget folks, um, and, and talked to um, partners. Um, so ultimately, um, I think you're going to get a better answer from Jay on, on that. I'll take your second question first terms of who's in the room. Um, governor Patrick is all about making government work better and innovative approaches to doing that. And some people in this room met with him, gave him this idea, and he immediately called me and said, you got to talk to these people and, and look into this. Good way to get it done. And um, <laughs> so I immediately <laughs> did. Uh, but we then, it then started this process, formal process that I described to you of the RFI to solicit formal um, an information request, which gave us lots of helpful information. The other thing we did in developing that RFI is we were very lucky to have the help of somebody who I think might be in this room, Jeffrey Liebman. Is he here? Hey, Jeff. Um, he is the greatest thing that's ever happened to my office. He came in one day. <laughs> He came in one day, um, it was about the same time we were starting to look at this, and he came in and said, hey, so, so I don't, for those who don't know Jeffrey, he's a professor of public policy at the Kennedy School who used to work with Robert uh, at OMB. The greatest th ever thing that ever happened to <laughs> <laughs> He came in, you know, he left OMB, he's, he's at Harvard, and he's, I don't know if he's, he's bored, but he's missing government <laughs> and missing public policy, and he came in to meet with me one day, I didn't know Jeffrey at all, and he just said, hey, um, I just want to help you in whatever way I can. And I said, I love you. I don't remember if I hugged you. Um, uh, but he has been, he and a team from his shop with some support from the Rockefeller Foundation have been um, helping us in a very intensive way at our table um, internally in the, in the weeds with the agencies, uh, w looking at the programs, um, and helping us think about this in a very analytical way. So they helped us. They've been kind of our informal advisors in developing the RFI um, and in the review of those proposals. Uh, in terms of the savings and how we think about that, we're not really at the point where we've started defining um, how we're going to look at that. But I'll tell you, um, as a budget guy, I think the right way to think about it is cost avoidance is cost savings. I mean, if we know. We're going to have costs, and we're going to have to budget for those costs if we can avoid them. That, that's significant and something that we should um, be taking, taking account of. Thanks. Yes, sir, in the front here, and then I'll go back there. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Brian O'Shaughnessy from Connecticut, and my question is primarily for Jay, but possibly for Linda as well. And you had mentioned that uh, for one of these programs to work, you need to obviously have uh, cooperation amongst a variety of administrative agencies and, and people who normally don't work together. And that's difficult, and I'm working on possibly a project within Connecticut, and we're seeing that. And I'm just wondering, um, whose responsibility is it to own it within government and to push it forward and to drive it and to make it happen? Because there will be people from the, from the private sector who, who have an interest, but from your, from your side of the table, who actually makes it happen? Well, I think across, when we're talking about different governments, I think it's going to depend. You know, obviously in Linda's case, it was Linda's program shop that, that drove it in New York. In Massachusetts, my secretary at administration and finance is, is um, modeled very closely off of or is very similar to um, OMB. So we've got both budget responsibility and lots of the backbone agencies that serve state government um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, and it's we have a lot of authority in a lot of, in a lot of ways internally within the administration. So we are constantly working with all the different um, secretariats and, and uh, service delivery agencies. So we have those relationships already. And we, in our office, uh, in a way that's similar to the role OMB has been playing at the federal level, have been driving uh, reform and innovation in across uh, state government. The governor has, um, aside from the fact that we're institutionally set up to do that, the governor has charged us 
with coordinating our reform efforts across state government. So we, we also just created in our office, we just got budget authorization and funding to do it, an Office of Commonwealth Performance Accountability and Transparency, which is now in my office, which is charged with making performance management happen across state government, um, improving program integrity across state government, improving accountability, transparency. So that office in Massachusetts is going to be the one driving um, these initiatives and coordinating the efforts with the program agencies that uh, are participating. And we are going to be the ones making sure that the contracts are structured in the way they should be structured and we've got the right um, tests in place and, and uh, um, back uh, audit uh, function in place to make sure that this is successful. I would actually, um, um, I think in the future in New York, we need to um, find a, a more generic home for it. Um, if you want to get the details on, on how we actually sort of pulled the team together, um, Kristen Meisner, who is my chief of staff and is actually doing this project um, in her free time because she doesn't have enough other things to do. Um, and so we didn't get an office set up to, to do it. We just sort of added it to the, to the day's work. Um, I think it needs an office, sustainability, um, not only because it's an awful lot of work, and there's going to be, you know, maybe a third of the suitable projects are, are outside my portfolio. And so it, I think it needs a, a place that can cover um, the whole range of city government or state. Or there's a question back there, if I remember. Uh, good morning. David Merriman from Cuyahoga County. Uh, I'm just curious, given the complexities of all of the, uh, the outside variables that exist, are you considering absolute outcomes and then a set return for the project, or is this going to be more value added and maybe a, a tiered response to the return? Thank you. David, uh, first let me say I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> Bay Village, love Cuyahoga County. Um, we are looking for both. I mean, we want better outcomes, and uh, we want to be able to leverage our resources to do more and serve more people. All these populations we're talking about, we aren't, we aren't doing nearly enough for nearly enough people. So um, this presents an opportunity, if we get this right, to be able to stretch our resources further. Um, but I also would like to see a return on investment for taxpayers and um, not only be able to to stretch our resources further for the populations we're serving with respect to the particular intervention, but also um, to stretch our resources further across state government, which is um, something we desperately need to find ways to do. Uh, the lady in the third row. Thank you. I'm Sadiqa Reynolds from Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, my question is, as it relates to homelessness or recidivism, are you seeing or would you all measure um, those outputs in economic development, for instance, because, you know, you would see an increase maybe in jobs or other things, and would that be tied into the contract, you know, into those things that we are willing to pay for as a government, or those just those other uh, return on investments that aren't necessarily measured, but certainly will exist um, when you choose um, programs like that? So I, I think the question is really good in this because it points out that there, there are many social benefits that could um, be a consequence of an intervention that's successful. From my perspective, for the reasons I described before about being able to quantify the success, um, I think for purposes of what we're going to measure and how we're going to define success, which we haven't gotten to yet, um, it's going to be a tighter world of um, positive outcomes, both financial and um, in terms of the people we're serving. We recognize there are, it could have Im other impacts for the economy and maybe even tax revenue with, um, to the extent someone's stable and not in a shelter, it's easier for them to get a job. And, but I think um, the, the further down the line you go, the, the more tenuous the connection between the results and the intervention. And I think in order for this model, this construct we're talking about to be successful from my perspective, we need to keep it as tight as possible. So um, I think we can talk about the fact that there are likely these other outcomes and to the extent we can measure them, um, that's great. But part of, the, part of the challenge with all this is, is figuring out where to draw the line uh, for purposes of measuring success. Over there, I'm trying to go in the left over. While the mic's going over there, we have about four minutes. 
Uh, Duke Shepard from Oregon. I'm interested on the investment capital side. Um, it seems that we're starting out talking about sort of the easier money being the philanthropic side and then this theoretical marketplace. But have any of you uh, had conversations or investigated pension funds as a potential source of investment revenue? I think there are people in this room who have had conversations with pension funds, but I would say that if there's one theme that has been expressed by all of the panelists, it's that we need to be extraordinarily pragmatic as we move forward with the first pilots of this concept. And so pragmatism calls for looking for investment from um, non-controversial characters and actors um, who um, may make a return on the investment, but it's clear that this is about um, doing good and supporting government and supporting service providers. So I would just say that, that um, one of the biggest things about this, this vehicle is that it puts the problem at the center, and instead of putting a particular funding budget or a particular investor's portfolio and their needs at the center, it puts the problem at the center, it creates interventions around that problem that are likely to solve it, and then it shares the return broadly across you know, siloed bu budget lines. But at the beginning, you have to define it tightly, as Jay just said. You have to find investors who are pretty patient capital, who are willing to um, understand that the terms of the contract aren't just about their return, but are setting precedent for the long run, and that that long run is where we can start to think about um, new kinds of investment in this field. One last question, leading the second row. Doria Farouki from uh, City of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my question relates to um, certain types of interventions that may be about doing business differently. So if, if, you, if you look at uh, both of the examples we talked about and the panelists discussed, there were prevention-based interventions which were new programs, it sounds like, but not replacing an existing practice or uh, you know, approach to doing business. In a situation where you can demonstrate real returns in changing the way you do business, which requires change management, significant risk, um, the investor's uh, risk is capped at what the you know investment is. So, based, I mean, w the worst that can happen is that they won't get their money back. But for mayors and governors, the downside for those sorts of innovations, which may be very high impact, is quite high. So, I was curious about whether the federal government is thinking about, and you mentioned at some point what role you could play. Uh, in this conversation, and I think that is a very important role because, uh, I mean, in Atlanta, for example, we're clear we want to do this. We just are trying to figure out what's the appropriate um, uh, intervention and contractual arrangement that would make it work and successful. But homelessness is an area we're looking at, and we want to consider replacing certain practices and programs with those that are innovative. And if we're able to say that the federal government is supporting five cities or four cities or whatever it is, even if it's through different programs, and the, the, that the federal government has skin in the game, it makes a huge difference in our ability to take those risks, even if they're evidence-based, but there's still risks because there's change management, there's a whole lot of selling that you have to do to challenge the status quo. I'm curious about what your thoughts are on yeah, that. So that's an uh, enormous challenge. I'll just, um, I'll tell you how we, we think about it, um, which I think may be different from how you think about it at a state or local level. Um, I mean, obviously the challenge is um, this is a new approach. It, it, it involves, I think, much more upside, but there's significant downside as well. To the extent you are introducing this new approach to the core basic services, there's there's downside regarding what if things go south on you. Um, on the other hand, to the extent you're doing it with incremental or add-on resources, we don't have a lot of those right now. Um, what we have done federally, in for example, in these evidence-based programs, and I think the way we would think about the social impact bond or pay for success is is right now as more of a, a 
pilot or, or add-on. That's just so the I3 program at the Department of Education is a now $150 million program within a $50 million Department of Education budget. Ditto for our workforce program. Um, uh, the, the differences aren't quite the same, but the concept is the same. Um, but the goal has to be for us at the federal level to leverage, to, to not just be talking about I3, but also to be talking about Title I. Um, and how we make that transition, I think, is, is very challenging. The, the best way I can think about it is to have a long enough time horizon that if we can be successful, as I think we've begun to be with these initiatives, and if we can build bipartisan support, which is challenging, but which we would like to do, then a few years from now we can think more about the transition into, into the base. But uh, to the extent we can do it faster, so much the better. On that note, what a great panel. What a patient panel. Thank you very much.